Yeah, the military in Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. It's the two o'clock block on a given Thursday. And guess what? Ed Case joins us. Representative Ed Case, it's so nice to see your smiling face, Ed. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me back. So it's always interesting to talk to somebody in Congress when Congress is in such disarray. And I wonder if you could get a, give us a, a little précis on, on how it's doing as you see it and how you're doing in it. Well, I think, you know, um, there are really two levels of Congress. Uh, the one level is what you actually do see in kind of the everyday, um, you know, media and the other presentation out there to the public. And it's not a pretty sight at all. I mean, Congress is very polarized. Congress is very divided. Uh, Congress, uh, too much of the time, is, is paralyzed by, by um, non-consensus thinking and, and, and and you know the the thought that if if I if I compromise with the other side, that's going to be viewed as a loss for me and a win for them, and it'll be put out there in the public that way, and that has just been really destructive on a number of levels. Um, <clears throat> it certainly has been destructive to some of the large policy calls that we've had to make make in our in our country and in our national government. Um, but on occasion, you have some bright spots. For example, uh, we did pass uh, to the point of this. Uh, uh, call a National Defense Authorization Act, which is our annual uh, defense bill. It's been it's been passed on time um, and um, you know on a on a fairly nonpartisan basis for decades now, and so uh, that was a good solid result. We passed a a bipartisan infrastructure package at one point two trillion dollars last year that was that was passed and is now in the process of rolling out to, to the country. I, I supported it very strongly. And so those are bright spots, but it's it's it can be very uh, dysfunctional and even discouraging on a day to day basis. There are whole areas of Congress uh, where we actually do uh, work pretty well together, um, a little bit below the radar. Uh, one area is on the House of, on the House and the Senate Appropriations Committees, uh, and I'm a member of uh, the House of Appropriations Committee, which is responsible for all uh, federal uh, funding uh, every year. And that committee tends to be a little less uh, partisan. We tend to, uh, you know, be a little bit more deliberative. And, and of course, we have our fights, but um, they're they're not, you know, mortal combat or anything like that. And so that's that's an area that works pretty well. And then there are a number of um, uh, caucuses, uh, which are, you know, fairly official organizations or or just working relationships that you that you put together on particular issues um, that are very, um, uh, you know, operate in a less partisan atmosphere. Uh, two examples of that would be, uh, I'm a member of something called the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is uh, a caucus in the House of 29 Democrats, 29 Republicans. Uh, and and uh, we're there to see whether we can find those uh, solutions uh, to some really naughty problems, whether it be immigration or China. Uh, I, I was just appointed a co-chair of the Problem Solvers Caucus, a China working group. Uh, um, and then the other area that- How, uh, how successful has that working group been? Uh, we just got going on it. Uh, we just actually had our first meeting this week uh, and um, we've got a lot on our plate, uh, clearly. And then the final thing I would uh, uh, answer from the, from the in general in Congress um, is um, Pacific Islands Caucus, which I co-founded uh, a couple of years back on a bipartisan basis. Um, that is, as it sounds like, uh, focused on uh, our country's relationship with the Pacific Islands themselves. So our backyard, uh, military, non-military, everywhere in between. And that caucus has been uh, quite a joy to work with. Uh, we've come out with uh, some, some uh, major legislation in this area, and uh, much of our legislation is now uh, adopted and passed uh, the U.S. House, and so I would I would I would answer you. It's a it's 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 a it's a mixture of a lot of things. Uh, but from my own personal perspective, sure, I get discouraged uh, quite a bit of the time. But um, I really can't afford to dwell in you know discouragement. I still I've got a job to do, and I just use whatever uh, position and whatever you know um, influence and 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 whatever tools are at my disposal to try to try to advance things in whatever way I can. Yeah. Oh, oh, voting rights, voting rights, voting rights is so important. And unfortunately, it's not stuck in the House. It's stuck in the Senate and not too much you can do. We've passed uh, we've passed very, very solid voting rights legislation in the U.S. House um, a number of times already. And I think that is one of the tragedies. That is one of the real 
um, areas where um, there just uh, is not any real good explanation for uh, the failure of some of my colleagues to move on on basic voting rights, but that somehow uh, the, the the maintenance and, and expansion of, of voting rights uh, represents a threat to them politically, which is a very sad commentary really on many, many areas. Uh, I hope we can, you know, overcome that at some point, uh, but it's that has been a discouragement to me. Well, yeah, uh, and uh, before we go off to the military issue, which I do want to discuss, and I know you do too, um, it's it's the issue of the select committee looking into January 6th. Uh, that must have implications all over the House. It's a House committee, uh, and it's um, very newsworthy and very important. Uh, you, you must be rubbing shoulders with those guys and girls. Uh, what What's your sense of it? With the select committee itself, or or with um, all select of the committee and the work of the select committee. Well, I believe in that select committee. I don't think you can you. I don't think you can let an event such as January sixth uh, happen, a major um, attack on our U.S. Capitol, an attack on our democracy. I was there. I, I you know I lived through it. I I, I felt it. Um, an embarrassment in the eyes of the world, uh, and just on so many levels, uh, you can't let that just be kind of, uh, you know, whitewashed off as just kind of a, a one-off uh, and, and a, a casual occurrence that just one day a bunch of people, you know, attack the Capitol. I don't, I don't, I don't think that you can let it go. Um, you've got to understand exactly what happened, why it happened, um, and you've got to hold people accountable that, uh, you know, uh, either made it happen or incentivized it to happen, and you've got to You've got to find the lessons in it, and 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 so um, you know I, I I'm really sorry that at the very very beginning of the of the um, this process uh, we came out with a, a strong very very bipartisan uh, bill with with equal representation on both sides of the aisle, um, and I thought that that was the right way to go. I thought I thought that um, you know we should all rise above it and and try to find out what happened, regardless of where that trail may lead. Um, that didn't happen, and so we, we we basically had to do it ourselves. Uh, and I support their work. Uh, I I don't know what the results are going to be, but um, I certainly expect uh, that um, we will get to the bottom of it, and that whatever we find will be um, uh, you know not only uh, fully transparent transparent to the American people uh, and to us, uh, regardless of whether that's it's a negative reflection on kind of how we went about things on that day or in preparation, but that we can learn the lessons from it. Mm. Yeah, and um, of course, um, there, those things, all those things are of great concern, but right now, immediately, as we discussed before the show, uh, Ukraine is a great concern, and that, and that does touch the military and the appropriations for the military and so forth. And I uh, saw in the paper today that, uh, in fact, we were sending troops to Poland um, in some substantial number um, so it's not boots on the ground, but it's boots close by. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are about that and how you, how you feel it affects um, the Congress and the people, the country. Well, you know, Ukraine is a sovereign country, a country that is aligned with us. It's, it's not technically part of NATO, uh, but certainly it is part of the community of nations, uh, of uh, Western Europe uh, and, and Eastern Europe who, who aspire to and want to uh, live under a, a system of govern, government, then we share those values, who want to um, you know, exercise their sovereignty, who want to um, you know, better their people, who want to um, um, practice uh, democracy, and who want to uh, be part of the international rules-based order that has maintained the peace uh, in our world for three generations now. Um, the peace didn't happen by accident. The peace happened because we, we came up with common rules and common ways of resolving conflicts. Uh, we memorialized them in institutions like the United Nations. Certainly NATO uh, is a part of, of, that, of that world. And so, you know, uh, the, 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 the threat, even the threat by any country to, to invade the sovereignty uh, of, of another country uh, who, who wants to go in that direction is a direct threat to us. Um, and it's not just about uh, Russia, and it's not just about Ukraine. Um, it is about uh, whether, um, you know, countries like China can, can do the same thing in, in the Indo-Pacific or beyond for that matter. And so, you know, this is, this is unfortunately one of those 
um, you know, very difficult situations where, where the implications are very severe and significant uh, for Ukraine itself, for Europe, um, and for the world. And we are part of this world. So, you know, sometimes I, I still, uh, you know, hear people saying, well, what business is it of, of ours, what happens in, in Ukraine? Uh, well, it is our business. Uh, we, we are part of this world. We are a leader of this world. Um, and we are being challenged by very authoritarian regimes uh, who want to impose a different view of the world on not only their own citizens, but the rest of the world. Uh, and that, that does affect us. And so you obviously have to ask yourself, so I'm not one of these that says, um, you know, let's go back into our own little world here and, and uh, you know, just worry about uh, purely our domestic uh, policy. First of all, in an interlocked and, uh, and interconnected world, we can't do that even if we wanted to do it. Uh, and second, it sounds very much like the 1930s at some point. Um, so we'll talk about learning lessons. Now, I, I'm not a proponent of, of, you know, boots on the ground in Ukraine, but I certainly am a proponent of, of, of taking every measure that we can uh, to dissuade Russia from invading Ukraine uh, and to make the consequences of Russia invading Ukraine so severe um, that um, either it decides not to do it to start with, which of course is the intent here, or decides it can't do it even if it starts to do it, or pays such a heavy price for doing it that it, that it and others never think about doing it again. So that's an economic response. That's a that is a defense response. We are helping Ukraine uh, with their own defense. Congress is involved in that. I believe we should help them uh, with their defense. We've we funded their their defense capability, um, and, um, and and we obviously do have uh, some obligation to be prepared for the worst uh, to include uh, a military presence um, in, in other parts of Europe. You know, what's interesting is uh, this somehow is different, uh, where uh, Vladimir Putin plays it out as a sort of chess game, um, and um, you never know what he's going to do the next day. But at the same time, I think it's a learning experience for this country, a learning experience for um, President Biden, because he's he's found new ways to deal with that. He's found new strategies for public opinion, for you know public discourse. And uh, in my view, I'd be interested in yours. My view is that he's doing a good job in order to deal with um, you know the misinformation, disinformation um, that we we are getting from Russia. Well, he's done a number of things. Well, I think I, I think in the in this area, um, you know, he has he has been, um, you know, I think he's found the right balance between uh, very straight uh, talking, uh, tough language, and and uh, with without, um, uh, you know, the kind of uh, um, attitude uh, that can 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 be projected out there in the world that can can be misinterpreted very, um, you know, easily and 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 cause the situation to spiral out of control. So a clear set of of consequences, um, I think that uh, one area has done a very good job of um, is is uh, working with our friends and allies and partners around the world to present a united front to Russia because because um, we we cannot do this alone um, and we should not do this alone. Um, if Europe doesn't care about what happens to Ukraine, kind of why should we? In some ways, and Europe does care about what happens to Ukraine, but we got to hang together. And countries like Russia and China are constantly trying to figure out whether they can shatter these relationships, whether they can divide uh, these alliances, and where, where, whether they can splinter um, the, the folks that um, they think are getting in their way of, of, of imposing uh, their system of government, uh, their system of, of directives and mandates, and own, and own, ver and own view of an interna international rules-based order, which is an order that they create and enforce um, on them, and so it's a it's very important for us to hang with our with our with our with with our people, and I think Biden has done a good job of that. Yeah, well, let's uh, let's move on to the military per se. We're here on the military in Hawaii, and I know you you know you have a report to make to us in a sense about uh, how the military in Hawaii is doing, and its connection with the federal government um, appropriations uh, and policy. Uh, what are your thoughts these days about how well the federal government is handling Hawaii and how well Hawaii is handling the federal government? 
Well, you know, of course, you can never um, um, get into this discussion, and I think it would be some time before we can get into this discussion without taking Red Hill straight on. And so I, I, I talk now, uh, leaving Red Hill uh, to, to, a, to, to its own specific uh, discussion. So these are general um, observations. Um, and I think Red Hill has changed some of this equation, which is, in, which is one of the really tragic consequences of Red Hill. But in general, um, let's, let's start at the beginning. I mean, um, if, if in fact we do believe uh, that we should worry about countries like Russia, like China, if we do believe uh, that we should, that we are um, um, a leader of the world and a partner of, of, of the world, much of the world, um, and a direct uh, ally of countries like Australia, like Japan, um, that we want to head in the same direction with countries like you know, India, with all of the countries of the Pacific Islands, um, that we uh, um, you know, uh, value our, our, our common uh, you know, heritage, identity, um, and values. Um, then you have to you have to be able to uh, present a very strong um, a defense posture out there in the world uh, because countries like Russia and China well they're not into this kind of a debate they're just into you know what's the strength and can we impose ourselves on other people it's very practical calculation and um, and so uh, I believe that we need to do all of that I believe that um, uh, we. We must uh, continue to, to do all of the above, I've already talked about. And I also believe um, that Ukraine notwithstanding, um, the front of this is the Indo-Pacific. And that is where the future, the present and the future of our country and our world are being charted. And we have to be involved across the board, but we have to have a strong military presence uh, throughout. And that's uh, far more difficult and complicated um, than, it, than it used to be, uh, primarily because of the rise of China, but not just China. Let's, let's not forget that Russia is a Pacific power. Um, Russia has a major fleet in the Pacific. Um, it has disputed territories in the Pacific. Um, it has comes down here and sends its Navy around Hawaii itself. Doesn't do that by accident. It's coming down here to see what it can learn and, and to make a statement. Um, and, and so, and it wants to leverage this relationship with uh, China. It wants to have an access with China. No? Well, yes, of course, because they have one common um, they have one common, you know, goal, uh, and they have one 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 you know country in particular that's kind of in their way. Us, of course, they have their own problems. Uh, so it's a it's a marriage of convenience, and it can unwind at any time. But right now, it's um, you know they, they they view it as in their mutual interest to to align um, and to present um, some kind of a united front, and that's a problem for the rest of the world, including us. So where that takes me to is um, that our Hawaii uh, <clears throat> is incredibly important in all of that, and that is our role, um, that is our responsibility to our country, um, and and I believe that uh, we need to embrace that uh, role and that responsibility. Sometimes I hear people say, well, if the military just wasn't here, then the rest of the world wouldn't pay much attention uh, to Hawaii. <laughs> That's dead wrong. Uh, we're not going to be able to escape the, 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 the circumstances of our geography, of our placement, of our, of, of our, of our, of our own history as a part of this country. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, I try where I can. Uh, to um, advance the interests of our military, uh, both in the Indo-Pacific, uh, as well as uh, specific to Hawaii. Um, and I am also fully cognizant, um, as we all should be, that in the process of doing that, we also have a direct benefit to Hawaii, given the uh, economic return of our military uh, uh, in Hawaii, which is, uh, which is major uh, with, um, you know, uh, somewhere around, depending on how you calculate this, but you know, 15%, 20% of our total uh, state economy is related in some way, shape or form uh, to the military. Um, whole segments of our economy that are very much related to the military, such as construction. Um, and um, you know, the fact of the matter is that's, that's fine with me if, if, we're, if, if, if we are, um, able to fulfill our responsibilities to our country and it will help us as well, then that's where we should try to focus our energies. And so 
there's a lot of different aspects to um, number one, you know, where and how our military is is in, is 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 um, involved in in Hawaii today, as well as kind of where it's going in Hawaii today, and and how I work uh, primarily on the appropriations uh, committee. Um, on the subcommittee on military construction, for example, which is about, uh, I think we have 10 members and we're responsible for all military construction across the country. Uh, so there's a number of areas where I'm able to really pitch in from this perspective, but I think maybe what I'll do is I'll just stop there and you, you can take the no, have, so I, you want to go. I fully, I fully take your point about the importance. In fact, we talk about this on the show, on the Military and Hawaii show all the time. Um, um, I, I, uh, I just wonder how you feel that that plays into the resolution of the Red Hill thing. Um, I, I remember uh, only a few days ago, uh, maybe it was your committee or maybe it was uh, Brian Schatz, uh, you, you found money uh, to rebuild uh, uh, you know, the tanks. Um, how did that happen? Where, where's that going? How does it play? Uh, when will it resolve the dispute, if at all? Well, well, first of all, um, let's 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 get into Red Hill here because there are a number of levels of Red Hill that are all disappointing. Um, the first and foremost disappointment of Red Hill um, is is the is is the fact that it leaked to start with that thousands of families were displaced, um, that they were injured, uh, that they lost their their pets, that they um, are still to this day uh, not back in their homes, that their children cannot go to uh, schools that are considered safe, that businesses are not fully open, that they rely upon. Um, and this is, this, is, this is not acceptable for our ohana. And I, I mean that in the broadest sense, because um, of course, uh, those of us that live here all of the time, they're, they're clearly, you know, we're all part of the same ohana, but so are our military families. It doesn't matter whether they're you know, here for six months or two years or five years. Uh, doesn't matter whether they're legal residents or not. Doesn't matter if they vote here or not. As far as I'm concerned, when they're here, they're here. They're part of us. They are us. And they have been severely affected uh, by, by, the, by, the, uh, by the leaks at Red Hill. Um, and second, of course, is the direct um, uh, risk posed to our own water, which um, so far, um, has not uh, showed up in, in non-Navy uh, drinking water system uh, wells, uh, but um, um, certainly could uh, still be there. It doesn't look that way so far, but we don't know that. Um, and just the general risk of Red Hill um, is, is very, very clear at this point. And then, fr and then frankly, I will say also that, that um, the Navy's response, in particular, the Navy's response was, uh, was not acceptable. Um, now it's a lot better now uh, than it was then, but it was um, it was it was um, you know defensive. It was um, in, in some in some ways um, you know um, uh, creating obstacles uh, to to getting to the bottom of what was really happening, and so and public statements were were very very unfortunate on a number of levels, and so the early days of Red Hill uh, continuing you know until fairly recently were really a disaster in many ways uh, for our Navy. Um, and, and so, you know, Red Hill has just been uh, really, really uh, bad all around, I would say. But um, on, a broadest, on the broadest possible level, our military presence um, here in Hawaii does depend on our support of our military. Our military cannot uh, carry out the degree of, of, of logistics, of preparation, of, of, of activity, uh, whether it be, you know, Pearl Harbor or Hickam or, or you know, Kaneohe Bay or Pakula on the Big Island or Kahuku for major training ranges or, or, or uh, training ranges that are, that are in state waters. They can't do that without our support, and we have supported them. Uh, I think most people in Hawaii understand the importance of our military, believe in our military, understand the mission, and support uh, the military presence here and the military's use of our resources that is necessary for the military to fulfill um, its duty and its responsibility um, to our country. And by the way, to us, because they do protect us as well. Uh, well, they stand ready to help us in times of natural disaster. 
Well, um, not, not just natural disaster, but uh, you know, a, a broader protection as well. So there is a benefit uh -huh. there, but um, that public confidence has been shaken by Red Hill, um, and the the I don't think that most of us distinguish uh, between the Navy and some other branch. Um, it is it is the military, and so uh, one of the real uh, consequences of Red Hill has been has been really a a a real um, a real um, blow uh, to uh, public support of our military in general. Now, I think most people can can distinguish between the failure of Red Hill and the overall uh, performance of our military. Uh, but uh, certainly, uh, the confidence that was there and the, and the kind of the carte blanche that was there um, that uh, will take a will take a while to recover. And of course, it depends very much on what the Navy itself uh, does in terms of, of the remediation of Red Hill uh, and of compliance with the state's order, which orders it uh, to defuel. And frankly, I think it's also going to depend at the end of the day on our Navy and our military in general uh, coming to a conclusion about, um, about um, all other alternatives uh, to Red Hill as a bulk fuel storage facility. Yeah. You know, it's interesting that, the, you know, the in World War II, um, the, the population was much less. Uh, there was a lot more land available to, to the military. Um, and they were a significant, a more significant, they are still a very significant part of the economy, but they were even a more significant part of the economy then. And, and the community has grown up around them. It's the old story. Uh, and now uh, when you say um, that collectively, we've got to find another place for them to go for their fuel storage, it's not as easy as it was. Yeah, that's that's true. The but the military does have um, um, an adequate footprint today uh, to fulfill their uh, reasonable needs uh, for a long time into the future. So um, the challenge, we don't have the challenge that uh, occurs some, place, some parts of our country and world where our military needs expanded uh, facilities to, in order to fulfill their function or such constraint on their uh, facilities that, the, that the, um, the friction between uh, civilian and military uses just becomes so acute uh, that it is very, very problematic to continue. Okinawa would be a good example of that where where we had major military bases um, right after the Second World War that were out in the boonies at the time. But then, um, you know, Okinawa uh, itself, the population grew up around those bases in a very dense way, and, and they have to move those bases, and I think they should move those bases. We don't have that here, uh, but certainly, um, again, the military does utilize not only its own land, not only its own resources, it utilizes our resources, it leases state lands, um, it, it um, you know, obviously um, occupies uh, um, and, and does joint use uh, with, with um, you know, uh, uh, much of our civilian community. It's not walled off. And so it's, it's really critical that, um, that, that the tragedy of Red Hill be remedied in a way um, that does restore public confidence uh, in our military, um, because I, I, I can't, personally, I can't accept the alternative. Now, you asked me about um, cost of Red Hill. Um, and, you know, my, my function over this last two and a half plus months of this crisis is, is I guess I would, I would put it into three buckets. Uh, number one, remedi uh, number one, taking care of those directly affected. Uh, so primarily our military families, um, flushing the water, testing the water, paying for their, for their temporary facilities, doing whatever we can uh, to take care of those directly affected right now. Number two, um, identifying exactly what happened at Red, Red Hill and why, uh, so that we can correct um, for even any movement of the fuel, um, for example, for defueling um, and remediating. So how do we actually restore the confidence of the rest of us um, that that water is safe, um, that you can go to any you know, water pipe in this, in this city and county and it's gonna be safe drinking water. Um, and um, as part of that, I think uh, um, the support for the state's emergency order, which again, uh, directs the Navy uh, to come up with a plan to defuel and then defuel. And then number three, the longer term consequence of, of Red Hill. And, and as, you, as you know, uh, 
uh, Congressman Kaheli and I uh, introduced a bill uh, just last week uh, where we crossed that last bridge and said, no, um, we need to close it. We need to come up with another way to satisfy bulk fuel, um, fuel storage facility uh, capabilities in the Indo-Pacific and you military will work with you, but you need to figure out what that's going to look like and then we got to close it. Now that's all going to cost billions and billions of dollars. We estimate that already um, this fiscal year, um, I'm sorry, not this fiscal year, but just, just really literally in the last 11 weeks, um, probably the cost is somewhere in the range of five to $600 million um, spent to date. Um, and it's going to go up to another couple hundred million, probably to a billion by the end of this fiscal year, which ends in, in, in September. And then, of course, we'll have to continue on from there. And as we finance uh, the, the, the defueling um, and the stabilization and um, the alternatives to Red Hill, those are going to be billions of dollars over the next uh, couple of years. We started down that road. Actually, it's interesting. Um, it's very, very topical because... Uh, the initiative that Senator Schatz uh, per, uh, initiated um, uh, was to utilize um, the current um, a bill that's moving through Congress right now. This bill um, is to um, extend for three weeks um, the, the um, current federal spending that is necessary. That extension is necessary because we have not completed our fiscal year 2022 appropriations. Uh, and so we have had to uh, pass what are called, uh, uh, what's called a continuing resolution. Um, and if we don't pass that continuing resolution, then the government runs out of money and has to shut down. Nobody wants to do that. So we just passed a bill um, in the house uh, to extend that period of time for another couple of weeks so we can finish our, our, uh, our, our work on FY 2022. Now, Senator Schatz uh, viewed that as an opportunity to do a down payment uh, from Congress on, on uh, the, the costs that, the, that have been in, in, incurred to date. And um, he and I worked with him on the House side because these, these bills have to originate on the House side, succeeded in putting in, into the bill that um, is passing through Congress right now, $403 million dollars. Um, it's the only funding, uh, additional funding mechanism in that entire bill. That bill is only about extending deadlines, and it's very, very unusual uh, to get funding like this. But our colleagues understood the, the, the dire needs here, and they, they uh, luckily, um, you know, agreed with us that we needed to start that funding. And I just was looking at my screen as we're sitting here talking. That bill passed the House late last week, and as we speak, the bill passed the Senate. And so it's going to be signed into law by the president um, in probably tonight, and that will that will directly appropriate uh, 403 million dollars to Red Hill. And I think that's also a good example um, of our delegation right now is really very strong in these areas. We have Senator Schatz and me are on the appropriations uh, committees, so the money committees, and Senator Hirono and Representative Kaheli are on the respective armed services committees. And so uh, we are all deeply involved in, in, in our military um, here in Hawaii and really throughout the world from both a direction and a funding uh, perspective. Uh, <clears throat> oh, that's great. That's, that's great to hear. Um, and I, uh, I, I hope this works out, it works out soon. But I think the bottom line, and I was interested in your thought about it, is that this is really infrastructure. The country changes, the military changes, federal facilities change, communities change, population development changes. And we have got to make the infrastructure change with those changes. This is, at the, at the end of the day, this is, this is another infrastructure project, isn't it? Uh, are you talking about Red Hill in particular or? or... Yes. Okay, absolutely. I mean, Red Hill is a, is a is a fuel storage facility. Um, it, 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 um, it functions extremely well um, as a national security asset. Uh, however, um, a national security asset cannot risk our drinking water. Um, and like any other um, infrastructure, um, it ages, um, it, it, um, and it you know, gets to kind of end of life, um, and it becomes outmoded. And, and 
And, and sometimes even the basic concept of the infrastructure uh, needs are, uh, are refreshing. For example, uh, consider that Red Hill is, uh, is the largest uh, fuel storage facility in the entirety of the Indo-Pacific. Um, and it obviously from that perspective has a critical um, a strategic uh, a purpose. Um, but um, that was a World War II concept that was, that was true for a number of decades after that, that you would actually centralize um, your, your, your fuel in one place and kind of bunker it up and protect it. And you'd, you'd kind of, you know, um, you know, come in and out with your, with your tankers to disperse it. But you have a, you have a different um, uh, threat now facing us, uh, much, uh, much more, um, you know, nimble uh, threat. Uh, and our armed forces need to be a lot more nimble and, and uh, be able to move around a lot easier and they need to be closer to the fight. And the fight is not here, at least we hope it's not, the fight is farther west. And so our military is, is, is and so if there's a silver lining at all in, in, in Red Hill, it is, it, is, it is forcing our military to, to go back to the drawing boards and ask themselves a basic question. Do we want a, 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 a large um, central uh, fuel storage facility that's kind of in the in the, in in you know thousands of miles away from where we're actually going to need it in a very short period of time in a in a in a in the worst case scenario, or do we want to uh, you know forward position it a little bit more and disperse it and 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 have it be a lot more nimble and mobile along with our forces and and so that's the analysis that they're going through right now, which is which was a requirement that we inserted in our our last national defense. Authorization Act before um, uh, the Red Hill uh, fuel leaks became, um, you know, um, um, you know, uh, happened. Uh, no, it sounds it sounds just like energy. Energy was centralized. You know, it was all the the hub, and then the spokes of the wheel would send it out to consumers. Um, now it's being distributed, so you have distributed energy. It's the same modern process. It's the same technological process, I think, in both cases. I mean, um, as you talk to some of our military, for example, they, they'll basically, you know, um, say, well, if, 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 the, if, the, if, the, if the, again, worst case scenario of a fight occurs, um, at, you know, in the South China Sea, just to pick an example, is it going to be over before you ever had a chance to get any of your bulk fuel storage uh, from from Honolulu there? Those are the kind of questions that they're going to have to, uh, you know, that they are answering. And so, um, uh, personally, where I think this is probably going to end up, besides the fact that um, you know Hawaii is by and large uh, almost uniformly opposed to any continued function of Red Hill as a bulk fuel storage facility. Uh, certainly, the congressional delegation has taken that position, as had, have the governor, so and as has the mayor of the city and county of Honolulu, and and so really we have a a real unity of of conclusion here, um, and obviously we're going to try to carry that through in in Congress itself using all the tools at our disposal. But I think um, that actually the military is going to come to uh, this conclusion on its own. Uh, mm. and, and so I think we'll all be aligned and we'll just have to be, you know, talking about how to achieve it rather than whether to do it. Well, I think it's nice and important to have you in that conversation that really um, with, with uh, this kind of collaboration, looking for solutions, we'll, we'll find one. Uh, we only have a couple of minutes left. In fact, we're over time, but during the program here, <clears throat> I have received two questions. They don't necessarily relate to everything we've been talking about. But if you don't mind, I'd like to pose them to you uh, quickly and uh, see what your thoughts are. The first one is seriously, when is the US government going to pay a fair rent for all the property that the government occupies in Hawaii? Example, 147,000 acres of prime land in Pohakaloa uh, for a dollar for 65 years. Really, that's one question. Thoughts on that? Um, I don't necessarily believe that our military should pay "quote unquote" fair dollar rent. Um, I, I could, I could, I could have this discussion on a lot of levels. And to be honest, I haven't thought it all the way through myself. So this is this is kind of a first reaction. Uh, but I do believe we have obligations. 
um, um, to, to our military. And I do believe um, that where we can help our military, uh, we should. Um, now, I believe that our military should help us as well. And I and I and I and I believe that it, it, that that uh, the degree of economic contribution to Hawaii from our military presence is a lot of help. And so, to some extent, I feel that if we have um, you know land like Pauklaw that that really would not be used for any other purpose, uh, where we can help our military, and and there will be a a benefit back to us uh, from our military that is enhanced by the availability of training ranges, then I don't necessarily believe I need to, to receive a dollar for dollar fair market value uh, in that context. However, I, I definitely believe the military has to take care of our resources. And so obviously it needs to spend the money to, to you know, preserve Pocolo or whatever the resource might be. But I, I guess I just don't look at it quite the same way. I, I acknowledge and understand the appeal of, of that argument, uh, but I think it's a little a little more broad and complicated than that. Um, if the military, you know, uh, clearly, if we were to pay, require them uh, to 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 pay uh, the, the the value of the use of that land by them, then I, I, it's not going to be the end of my day. But um, I, I don't automatically go there. Yeah. Bottom line is, we want to maintain the best possible relationship with the military. We go back a long way. The Navy was at Pearl Harbor in 1850. We are intertwined in our history, our culture, our, our interest. Uh, well, second question, Ed, what suggestions do you have? This goes back to our earlier discussion of the program. What suggestions do you have to bring our society back together? Legitimate question. Whether locally or nationally, uh, are our divisions, uh, divisiveness, I suppose, real or mostly hype and manipulation of and by media? Well, I, I think our divisions are real. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I don't, I don't believe that they're somehow fictitious. Uh, I don't, I don't believe that somehow the very, very strongly held and diametrically opposed views of, of, of our fellow citizens um, on a variety of issues today are, are, are some figment of somebody's imagination or, or hype. I certainly think that division um, is amplified by how we talk about division, how we treat division, how too often parts of our society exploit a division for their own purposes. And so I think we are, we are, you know, uh, we are a divided society to start with. Uh, we've become more intolerant of each other's perspectives and, and less willing to, to try to find that that um, that mixing ground where where we all give up a little bit of our own um, you know thoughts in order for a for a common good. So I, I think that's very real. Um, so I don't take that lightly, um, and I I don't believe that the solution here is to shut down uh, free speech and and say well you know you can't exploit those divisions. I hate the fact that they are being exploited, but uh, the, the, the 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 opposite side of that is to is to not have people talking about divisions to start with, I, I can't accept that solution. I think we've got, I think we all have to practice what we preach. If we all, you know, if 90% of this country thinks that it's way too polarized and way, way too, you know, divided, um, and we can all agree on that to start with, then you can't go around and say, well, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to insist on my way or the highway. You can't go around and, and not look to the other to the other viewpoint and ask, is there, is there, is there merit in that viewpoint? Can I understand it? Can, is there some way to, to find a con conclusion on it? So what I try to do myself, because I'm a leader of this country and, and I feel that I, that I need to, um, you know, practice what I preach. So I try uh, very hard not to, do, I, I'm very careful with the kind of rhetoric I use and, and how I use it and in what circumstances. I try where I can uh, to find those consensus uh, positions, even if, even if it means, um, you know, not not exactly the way I would do it. I try when I, when I do, disagree. And our and our let's face it, democracy is 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 not about all agreeing all the time. Democracy is about, you know, providing for for a common view of it that uh, generally represents the majority, subject to protection of min minorities. And so we're going to have these debates. Um, you know, should we have a wall on the border or not? Um, 
should we invest um, you know um, X amount in 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 the defense of uh, you know our country and in, in the Indo-Pacific or put that money towards some other social program? These things are part of the decisions we have to make in a democracy. We we don't have Putin, you know. We don't have you know autocratic presidents, and and so we're going to have these debates, but we can have them in a way that doesn't question each other's loyalty to the country, doesn't question each other's motivation uh, to the country. I hear people say outrageous things in Congress sometimes. It's outrageous. There's nothing that I agree with. Um, but I try not to go to the, to the next step and say, they should not be my fellow citizen. Uh, you know, sometimes I feel that way, but I can't go there. And, and so I think, you know, we all have an obligation here. We can't just sit here and say it's somebody else's fault that there's so much polarization and division and then, then go yell and scream at social media and, and call somebody a personal jerk because they have a different viewpoint than what you have. So that's a long way of saying, um, yes, it's very divided. Yes, it's very polarized, but I don't think it's hopeless at all. Um, I don't think it's irreversible, but I think it's going to take some some practice and action um, by all of us. Thank you, Ed. Um, Representative Congressman Ed Case uh, in Congress, uh, one of our delegation, joining us today on the military in Hawaii. And I have to tell you that while we were talking, other questions came in, just shows how popular you are. And I hope we can circle back and, and have another discussion to answer those and any other issues that come up. In any event, thank you very much. Ed. Thank you. And uh, for the for the questions, case.house.gov um, is, is how to reach me. So if you if you just want to reach out to us uh, straight, we'll, we'll try to answer your question. But yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd welcome it. And I appreciate the opportunity to uh, add some perspectives, especially on on our on our national defense and our military, especially in the Indo-Pacific. I think this is a critical area for all of us. Thank you, Ed, and thanks to the people who sent questions in. Aloha. Aloha.